Indeed, God has been faithful. I thank God for this opportunity and privilege of just being here to be able to worship with you and to share God's word with you. Indeed, it was early this year when our youngest brother passed away and I remember just leaving his um, place of abode when I received the call from Sister Burton. Didn't recognize the number, but when she introduced herself to me, she asked if I will be willing to come and to share God's word. Um, she didn't know that I was in bereavement myself, but I was happy to accept that appointment and was saddened when I had to watch the funeral service of the late Sister Burton right here. And so my condolences to the Burton family. Just this week, during our worship service at the South England Conference Office, we were informed of another death that took place and has shaken this church here. And I just want to let you know that as a conference family, our hearts goes out to all our members within the churches. We meet every morning to um, have our devotions and prayers. And um, we have lifted you up in prayer. And so please be comforted by the fact that God who sees everything, God who understands the pain of what it means to lose a loved one is there to comfort and to cheer. So on this very special day on our widows and widowesses day, I want to say take courage. God is still with us and it won't be long that our loved ones will rise again. And what a great reunion that's going to be. Amen. Having the assurance that affliction shall not arise the second time. Having that assurance that we will never part again. Amen. So I want to speak um, to us this morning um, by first of all referring to a passage of scripture in the book of Revelation. I understand that the theme for your month is spiritual warfare and your pastor, I thank him, Pastor Smith and Pastor um, Kujo, for extending this invitation and for the work that they do. It's not easy being a pastor and the words of encouragement and your prayers, believe me, it goes a long way in helping us to discharge our duties as ministers of the gospel. So please continue praying for your pastors. In the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, Revelation chapter 12, and I want to read for us verses 7 through 10. Revelation chapter 12, reading verses 7 through 10. The Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan 
which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. It's a time for rejoicing. The accuser of our brethren has been cast down. When we speak about spiritual warfare, we are speaking about a battle between good and evil. We are speaking about a battle between the forces of good against the forces of evil. Christ against Satan. I want to share with you my very first experience of spiritual warfare and then I want to share two battles that took place on this earth as recorded in Scripture. And then hopefully tie that in to the hope that we have as we guard our minds in this spiritual warfare that we are engaged in. It was in the mid-80s, whilst at the seminary, I was doing a New Testament course, and our professor asked us to write a paper. My subject was the exorcisms in the Gospel of Mark. And so as I did my research, a godly professor approached me and said to me that, listen, I'd like you to come to my home this evening because there is a, a member who is having some spiritual problems at home and I believe that your research and your study will help you in this meeting that we will have. I didn't know what to expect but because of my respect for that godly professor I made my way to his home and when, we, when I got there both himself and his wife sat me down and shared with me some of the um, principles involved in spiritual warfare. I listened attentively. Then he asked me that when we enter into this battle, he will be praying but he asked me to keep my eyes open so that when the forces of evil manifest themselves, then we will be able to engage in this warfare. He told me what those signs were. I will not repeat it because I know that many people like to go around looking and start, you know, that this person must be But I sat and listened. And as we had finished, the knock on the door indeed 
this lady came to the house um, and she had two children with her. And when the professor introduced her um, to myself and my wife, we exchanged pleasantries and she began to tell us her story. How her neighbor had been practicing witchcraft and casting spells and affecting her in her home. The lady was dressed elegantly, a church member, and so I listened carefully as she told her story. And after she told her story, my professor asked some questions and then invited her for prayer. As we knelt down and the professor lifted up our hearts to God in prayer, he concluded his prayer by saying, and God, if indeed this is a case of demonic possession or activity, please make it manifest. Then he paused. My eyes were open as I watched for those signs. He continued to pray after the pause because there was no manifestation. And then as he prayed this prayer, that Lord, because there is no manifestation, we thank you. Immediately that woman was thrown onto the ground. She began to writhe like a serpent and as the demons manifested themselves we knew without a shadow of a doubt that the supernatural forces were at work. The children by this time were already upstairs out of the way. It was just the professor, his wife, myself and this lady and the professor went into spiritual warfare. I listened as he prayed offensive prayers, as he commanded the unclean spirits to leave this woman. I witnessed, saw, and heard with my own eyes how this woman now began to speak with a, a very deep and guttural voice as she began to communicate and um, enter into a debate with the professor. The professor did not want to entertain any discussions but commanded that unclean spirit to come out of her. The unclean spirit identified itself and began to speak. During that interrogation, I witnessed at least three unclean spirits depart from this woman, and I knew clearly when they departed because of the sound they made, and it was so real, never experienced spiritual warfare before. Suddenly, that deep guttural voice spoke up again and said, He's got the children. Immediately the professor says, he is going up to deal with them, with the children. So he said to me, you remain here and continue the battle. What was I to do? I've never experienced this before. And so when he went upstairs, Thank God for this godly wife who was by my side. And the woman who was now possessed said, looked glaringly at me and started laughing and snarling and coming towards me. The professor's wife said, the demon is mocking you. Rebuke it in the name of the Lord. And my friends I don't know where the words came from, but all I remember saying was, the Lord rebuke you. 
The Lord rebuke you. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ is against you. And I watched as the woman began to cower down like this. It was then that I understood and recognized that there is power in the name of Jesus. Never before had I witnessed this. That evening, I recognized at least another two or three unclean spirits leave this woman. The professor then came back down and continued the battle. By the end of that session, at least 10 unclean spirits had come out of this woman. This woman, when she had finished, she got up, she made herself decent, and she offered a lovely prayer herself, and it's as though she did not understand or know what had taken place. She fixed herself up. We exchanged a few words together and she left. The professor asked me to stay behind just to analyze what had just taken place. I say this was my first experience. The battle is real. For those who think that the devil is just a figment of one's imagination, no. But we serve an awesome God who is alive, who is all powerful. And at the name of Jesus, every unclean spirit must bow. There is power in the name of Jesus. So when we enter spiritual warfare, know that in every battle that takes place, Jesus wins. Always. Jesus, as he was about to begin his earthly ministry, we are told that even though John was his first cousin, they hadn't met to communicate together. But John was out there in the Judean wilderness preaching a message. And Jesus, together with the many who had gone to listen to the word of God being presented, Jesus now came and walked into the Jordan River. When John saw him, there was a purity about Jesus which was like no other. He could distinguish him amongst the entire crowd. As Jesus approached John, amongst the multitude, John spoke to Jesus, I have need to be baptized of you. And comest thou to me? Our Lord spoke and said, Suffer it to be so now, so that we can fulfill all righteousness. John baptized our Lord. When Jesus emerged out of that Jordan River, he knelt down at the banks of that Jordan River and such a prayer that has never been uttered nor heard before, Jesus prayed this prayer. And as he prayed this prayer, the Bible tells us that the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God descended in a form of a dove the whole countenance of Jesus, the person of Jesus began to illuminate. A light shone around him and there was a voice that was heard clear and distinct. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John heard it himself. There were others who also heard it, but the rest of them simply said it had thundered. Because God the Father had now spoken and the Spirit of God had anointed Jesus as the Messiah. He is now beginning his earthly ministry as the Christ. For that's what 
Christ literally means the anointed one. Or in Hebrew, the Messiah has now come to begin his public ministry. And after that wonderful scene, you could imagine everyone was so awed by that experience. Jesus now made his way into the wilderness where he is now about to contemplate and to wrestle with God and to pray about his earthly mission. The whole plan of salvation was hinged upon Jesus being successful in his earthly ministry. Jesus fasted 40 days and nights without taking anything into his body. He was wrestling with God for God to open the plan of salvation to him. For God to be there by his side as he works for the salvation of yourself and myself. At the end of this 40 days, Jesus was weak. His whole body was weak. In fact, the prophet Isaiah says that his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So weak. Satan now seizes this opportunity. I want to let you know, my friends, Satan fights dirty. He waits until Jesus is at his weakest, at the point of death, and then he comes in. This attack is something that he cannot leave to his demonic angels. He has to take this on himself. And so he approaches Jesus at his weakest. He transforms himself. Look how devious he is. He transforms himself as an angel of light approaches Jesus at the point of death. You know, sin makes us fools. Sin distorts our minds. Because Jesus was the one who created this angel. And now you deceive, you're trying to deceive him. You turn yourself as an angel of light. You come to the creator. And, and these are the words that Satan says to Jesus. To you and I, it's not a temptation. But to Jesus, this was a real temptation. Because the body was craving for food. The body was at the point of death. Where Adam failed on the point of appetite, Jesus must now conquer where Adam failed. Adam was the father of the human race, but Jesus is the second Adam, the one who has come to redeem the human race. And so, where Adam failed, Jesus is now about to conquer. He has entered this spiritual warfare. And Satan, having assumed the form of an angel, comes to him and begins to deceive our Lord. He says to Jesus, just like Abraham was about to offer his son as a sacrifice, the angel of the Lord came and stayed the hand of Abraham so that he did not take the life of his son. I am that angel. Jesus, God has sent me with a message. 
You see all these rocks around. Your body's craving for food. Turn them into bread and eat. Satisfy yourself. Which one of us, at the point of death, wouldn't be tempted to use our powers to turn bread with stones into bread, to feed. After all, we have to live. What good would we be if we die of starvation in the wilderness? Turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God. In other words, what took place 40, 40 days ago when the Spirit of God descended and rested upon you. What took place 40 days ago when the voice of God the Father was heard saying, you are my beloved son. Doubt God. If indeed you are the son of God, command these stones to be made into bread. Eat and satisfy yourself. I thank God that Jesus, for those 30 years, had fortified his mind with the word of God. So he was now able to quote from the writings of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Here, Satan is rebuked now. The warfare is real. The battle is raging. Jesus is at the point of death and Satan attacks him. Command these stones. Doubt the word of God. And isn't that what we go through? So often, when we are faced with temptation, the temptation is doubt the word of God. In other words, when Paul says the just shall live by faith, what he's actually saying is that the just or the righteous shall live by God's word. Satan has now come challenging. Don't believe God's word. Believe in what I'm telling you. Command these stones to be made bread. And when Satan saw that in this first assault, he has lost and Jesus has won. He then picks him up, still as an angel, picks up our Savior, takes him up to a high pinnacle there in the temple and says to him once again, listen, fall down. Fall down. Throw yourself down. If you, indeed you are the Son of God, cast yourself down for it is written, so, so you're not the only one who can quote scripture, Jesus. How can you challenge someone about the word of God, who is the word of God? If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written in the book of Psalms, he shall give his angels charge over you. Throw yourself down. I thank God that Jesus has fortified his mind with the word of God. And I encourage our widows and widowers, let us fortify our minds with God's word. Jesus, on hearing that, was able to recognize that Satan had intentionally omitted the rest of that scripture. For the Bible says that, you know, he shall give his angels charge over you whilst you are doing his will. And so, was it the will of God for him to throw himself down at first? Was that not presumption? It is written, Jesus met him with the word of God. So now the battle is raging. This spiritual warfare is going on 
But Jesus, having guarded his mind, fortified his mind with God's word, was now able to quote that scripture. Satan lost this second assault. Jesus always wins whenever there is a confrontation between Christ and Satan. But he doesn't give up. This time, he takes Jesus to another mountain and he is able to give Jesus a panoramic view of the glories of this earth. All this belongs to me. He says, now he's removed his garb of an angel. He's been exposed. He knows, well, he's been exposed. So there's no need to come over as this bright angel of light because he's been caught out twice. But he says, all these belong to me. I will give it to you if you would just bow down and worship me. That's what the great controversy is all about. Who do we give our allegiance to? Who is it that occupies the throne of our minds? Satan says, fall down and worship me, and I will give all that this world has to offer to you because it is mine. Jesus doesn't even enter into a discussion or a debate with Satan, but simply states with the full authority of the Godhead or the second person of the Godhead, the Lord rebuked thee. The Lord rebuked thee. We should worship the Lord our God and only him shall we serve. And with that, Satan flees from the presence of Jesus. Jesus is victorious in this battle that takes place. And so we discover that in my own experience, engaging in spiritual warfare, Jesus wins. In the life of Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, we can go even before that because when Jesus was born, Satan dogged his every footstep. He tried to annihilate Jesus by killing all the boys from two years and under. This is the work of the evil one. And it, was, it came to a crescendo right there when he was 13 after his baptism. But that still was not enough. The greatest battle was yet to be fought. And that took place three and a half years after this event. Jesus, knowing that his time had come for him to depart from this world, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, asks his disciples, the close disciples, stay and pray with me. But you know how it is? Sleep is sweet, especially when you're tired. So they fall asleep. When eventually Jesus comes and says to them, listen, arise, our accuser, our adversary is here. Judas Iscariot leads a group of chief priests, church members, leaders of God's church, and soldiers with them. And they come to Jesus. Jesus steps out to go and meets him, meets them, and he asks them, who do you seek? They responded, Jesus of Nazareth. The Savior steps forward, I am he. And when he pronounces those words, I am, divinity flashes through humanity. His face begins to illuminate. And the wicked people see it, and the Bible says they fall backwards at the presence of the Son of God. Jesus asks them again, whom do you seek? We seek Jesus of Nazareth. I told you I am he. And yes, when they see the divinity of Christ, well, his disciples wake up and Peter, you know the story, takes out his sword and cuts off Malchus's ear and uh, Jesus 
fixes and heals even wicked people's ears. And you see, that's the difference between God's people and wicked people. Wicked people will seek your destruction, but Jesus will heal the ears of even the wicked. He is taken to Pilate and then to Herod and back to Pilate again. He goes through the mockery of a kangaroo trial. And Jesus maintains his dignity, his kingly bearing. He answers nothing when they question him. Eventually, they condemn him to be crucified. He has to carry that heavy cross and it got to a stage where they recognized that he is physically unable to carry that cross and so they get a hold of Simon of Cyrene and command him you carry his cross go to the place called Calvary there you can see how the wicked will struggle when they are about to be crucified but Jesus freely gives out his arm he is nailed to that cruel cross. He is lifted up and you can see Satan now with all his evil hosts there at the cross. And the battle, my friends, is raging. Let me tell you, uh, read to you how this battle went in Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 15. Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 15. Listen to what the Bible says. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, over them in it. Jesus met Satan and all the forces of evil at the cross, the Bible tells us, and he openly triumphed over them in it. How? Well, Satan possessing those evil and wicked people at the foot of the cross began to taunt him and jeer at him. He saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe him. What a temptation because, friends, he had the power to come down from the cross. He had the power to call 10,000 angels. But Jesus chose to remain on the cross because of the love he has for you and for me. The battle was raging. Jesus hanging on the cross, listening as Satan jeers and Satan taunts him. They don't deserve it. You have come to save them, but look what they're doing to you. Even God has forsaken you. Friends, a dark cloud overshadowed the cross when Jesus was hanging upon that cruel tree. God the Father was close to his son, but Jesus could not penetrate and see through that darkness. Angels refused to look upon that scene because they had never seen their loving Savior go through this. Now Satan's mask was removed. For the very first time in the history of antiquity, angels, beings from unfallen worlds, now see who Satan really is. Because here the Son of God, who has done no wrong, is being treated this way. Picture him as he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what, a, what they do. What a savior. What a savior. People who are crucifying you. And yet Jesus prays for them. Eventually, Jesus cries out, It is finished. Everything to secure your salvation and my salvation has been accomplished. It is finished. Jesus has paid the price. 
Therefore, you and I can have the assurance of life everlasting. It is no wonder that when this took place, the angels in heaven, and we read it earlier in our scripture reading, the Bible says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, now is come salvation. Now is come strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. No longer can Satan go up into heaven claiming to be the representative of this earth. Jesus, my friends, wins every battle that he is confronted with. And so what can I say to our widows and widowers? God is faithful. The price has been paid. We have the assurance of life everlasting. Things might be rough here on this earth, but it's only for a short time. What is a short period of time in comparison to eternity? Soon, my friends, and very soon, the controversy will be over. Soon and very soon, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And it's not going to be no secret. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. Soon and very soon will be heard the voice of God calling those loved ones whom we have put to sleep Soon and very soon, we will hear the voice of Jesus calling. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. There will be reconciliation. We who are alive and remain, we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the end. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Widows, widowers, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.